Blog Talk Radio. I said, 
I'm just going to wait until he appears. And he did appear on the first day of my freshman year at Vassar College. I had been shut out of all the intro sociology classes, and the secretary said, go ask the department chair, Jean Pin, if he can find a seat for you in one of the closed classes. The minute I stepped into Jean's office, I had the first and only out-of-body experience in my life. I felt my soul shooting at a high speed through a tunnel to the end of my life. Then I shoot back into my body, and I get this message, remember every aspect of this meeting, he's going to be everything to you one day. Then... I forget about it. But soon after meeting Jean, I found out that Jean had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests in history. For most of his life, he had taught at the Vatican. He founded a movement called Liberation Theology, designed to fight church oppression from within. He was a radical feminist priest, and he launched to international fame when he publicly opposed the Pope and the Catholic Church as they were trying to block the legalization of divorce. And he didn't want to see women trapped in marriages where they were being abused. So he fought on the grounds of liberation theology, religious freedom, separation of church and state. The church should butt out of the private sector. He won. He changed the course Uh of Italian history, got the divorce bill passed. Now, soon after, the Pope granted him the dispensation of his vows, so he wasn't excommunicated, and he left the Jesuit order and the priesthood where he was recruited by Vassar. Now, he had been to Vassar, at Vassar, as the chair for 10 years on that day that I met him. Now, in my senior year, four years after that fated meeting, Uh I needed help with the statistical portion of my thesis, and I had heard, among other things, Jean was also a statistician, having founded the Vatican's first and only social research center. So I asked him, can you help me with the statistical portion of my thesis? Even though he wasn't my advisor, he cheerfully gave me his time, and I tell you, Susan, within a couple of weeks, We were madly in love. We knew, despite our different cultural backgrounds, religions, we were completely compatible. We were just like soulmates, twins separated at birth. Now, I have to say, because this is really important, I was raised by two devout Jewish atheists. My parents, the only religion they practiced was religiously hating each other. (laughs) They taught me not to believe in God or the afterlife. I never read the Bible or went to church or synagogue. John and I did not discuss religion, at least not when he lived in a body. So here we are, crazy for each other, inseparable, restoring houses together, writing books together, just crazy for each other. And we are together for 27 years. In the last year of his life, we both had premonitions separately, that he was going to die of an accident. We just didn't know when or where. On the last day before we left for our vacation to Italy, lightning struck the rose arbor and destroyed it, and then I saw about 50 black crows in the yard, huge crows, and I got a bad feeling, but we went anyway. So now we're in Italy. After days of rain, we're sitting on the beach, and Jean's hand is up over his head, and the next thing I know, a bee swoops down, and stings his hand at the exact location of Christ's stigmata. And then I watched my beloved suffocate to death in front of my eyes. Mm. Now, what is so extraordinary is that I was lying there in the bed in the hotel room. I am freaked out. I'm shaking. I'm trembling. I mean, he's ripped from me. And the next thing I know, I feel his hand stroke the entire length of my spine. I sit bolt upright because I know what I felt. I look over my shoulder. Obviously, nothing and no one is there, but he was there. And he has been with me ever since. And he has been producing, up until this day, astonishing and ongoing manifestations in front of witnesses to prove that we don't die and our relationships are not meant to end in death. So as a result, I've created a groundbreaking new transdimensional grief therapy method that totally diverges from the Western approach, which is grieve, let go, and move on, which only leaves the bereaved at an even greater loss. Instead, my method shows you how to say hello, not goodbye, without the assistance of a medium, channeler, or psychic. And then there's one more thing. 
because as a shrink I know, millions of people worldwide still harbor unfinished business with someone who's passed. And again, Western grief therapy offers us no way of making peace with the deceased. So my new Dialoguing with the Departed technique offers you the first vehicle in history for not only reconnecting but also making peace with the deceased. So that's Love Never Dies in a nutshell. That's a beautiful summary. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I find is so approachable about your work is the fact that you were an atheist and how you yourself, Dr. Jamie, exhibited the kind of receptivity, apparently just naturally you did yes. it by by even yes. accepting pre- premonitions and and then you know yes. all the different things that started to happen to you. How can you help convey that to people who are listening now, who who have similar um, skepticism perhaps, or you know who yeah. don't believe in God? And how well, how can you, know, you help the thing them? Is, I can give you the example of my own mother, and I talk very mm-hmm. personally in part one of Love Never Dies, my own memoir. My mother was at my house the night before the funeral, and she picked a fight with me And on the morning that I had to go meet with Jean's priest to discuss the readings for the funeral, my mother told me to go F myself, right? So I yeah. leave the house. Yeah. I'm hysterical hysterical crying right and I say Jean look what I'm left with this is what I'm left with you know I'm this is like a holocaust of my heart you know this is what I'm left with so two months later on Christmas Eve to be exact my mother phones me and she says I want to tell you what happened after you left the house that day she said after you left I heard the most enraged furious pounding on the walls Mm -hmm. and it went on for a half hour until I fled the house in terror so I say to her but mom You don't believe in God or the afterlife. And this is what she said. I still don't believe. I just know what happened. (laughs) So (laughs) so the point is, don't worry about what you believe. Don't worry about what you believe or don't believe. Just be open. Because, you know, I think it was Shakespeare who said, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So the point being, if we don't understand it, it's of the divine, and the of the divine events are not fathomable by the human mind. So you don't have to understand it. Just be open to the mysteries of all kinds of things that our mere little mortal minds cannot understand. What I appreciate about your work is that you don't narrow down a definition of the divine either. You know, I no. think a lot of times people have... Precon- they have preconceptions, and so they become atheists because they think, you know, the divine is this very narrow um, portrayal of God. Really, God is what love. you convey it's just is love. love. <laughs> yes. Love. <laughs> yes. Yes. So can I give you a sense? I mean, a lot of times Absolutely. when I speak publicly, I tell people, you know, just so you have a sense of what showed me that love yes. never dies and that Jean is still here. So let me give you a few examples from part one of Love Never Dies, my memoir part, where I pick up from the night that Jean left his body. So I come back from Italy, and I hadn't slept for days, and this first night alone in our bed it was no exception. I was awake, and I stagger down to the kitchen, and I hear Jean saying to me, and it's not that I'm hearing voices. It's more like a thought that's implanted in my head. It's, I found out afterward it's called mind-melding. Right? So he puts this thought in my head. He says, Jamie, open the kitchen door. I want to show you something. So I open the door. And sitting on the step is a chipmunk. Now, I look at this chipmunk, and he is not acting like chipmunks act. He's frozen in place. He looks like he's in a trance, and he doesn't run away when I stand right there. And his eyes look glazed over, too. Next thing I know, this chipmunk begins to mimic my husband's bodily death. He's ripping at his little face with his hand in the exact way that my husband was ripping at the oxygen mask because the air wasn't getting in. And I'm crying as I'm watching this. And for 20 minutes, I'm watching this torment. And after about 20 minutes, I see this chipmunk visibly cough up a wonk of mucus and he's in peace. And I knew Jean was telling me, I'm okay, Jamie, and he was showing me through this little animal. I've come to coin the expression open vessels. Animals, both domestic and wild, are open vessels for the spirit to speak. He was showing me through this open vessel he was fine. Now, a couple of days later, I have to fax Jean's 
death certificate to my phone carrier in order to take his name off the account. I had sent many multi-page faxes throughout the day, no problem. But when I go to fax his death certificate, the cover letter faxes without a hitch, but then the machine freezes and will not fax the death certificate. I try again with the obit. Again, cover letter faxes, obit won't fax. I try 20 times. I finally give up. The next day, I take these documents to my lawyer. I don't say a word. I just say, could you fax these for me? And I'm waiting and waiting. About 20 minutes pass. And finally, all the secretaries come out of the back room hysterically crying, saying to me, Jamie, we tried 20 times. The cover letter faxes, but the death certificate and the obit will not fax. He's trying to tell you he's not gone. Okay. Now I go home later that day, and again I have to fax the obit, and again it hangs up after the cover letter. So I say to him, Jean, I think you keep doing this because you want me to know that you are not gone. And if I promise to remember, will you let the fax go in its entirety? I cancel the fax. I feel a tidal wave of love pouring into me, which I knew was his acknowledgement of, I heard you now, okay. And now I issue the fax again, and it goes through in its entirety. So now I'm starting to get the idea he's coming through what I call earthly props, which are electronic devices. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we speak. So now strangers are walking up to me. And they're saying to me, they don't know me, they don't know Jean, they don't know I'm widowed. They just say, your husband says, tell our story, and they walk on. And this is happening to me over and over. I'm getting letters saying this to me from people I don't even know. Now I'm driving one day, and I feel like I need to pray to Jean to help my friend Emily find love. Emily never met Jean. He obviously didn't know her. And I make the prayer, and... I feel, again, that tidal wave of love, like it was Jean's way of saying, I heard you, I got it. And I look at the clock, and I take note, it's 4.58. That night, Emily phones me, and she says to me, Jamie, you will not believe what happened to me. I said, what happened? She says, today at 4.58, my, my... my, my mind fell into a trance. This is what she says. I just went into a trance, and your husband appeared to me in this trance. And she said, she described what he looked like. I said, yep, that's Jean. So she says he told her uh-huh. to find love, follow the gray stones to the church in your neighborhood. Now, by having her repeat my prayer to him, he was validating that he had heard my prayer to him. So he was validating his presence in my life, but he was also blessing Emily by sending her to this church. Now, the next week, I'm in my professional group, and Emily tells this story. As she tells the story, another member of the group named Mitch, who used to be a seminarian, says to her, what's the name of the church in your neighborhood? She says, oh, it's the Claremont Church. And Mitch says, oh, my gosh, the Claremont Church is New York's only liberation theology seminary. So do you wow. see Jean founded Liberation Theology? He put his stamp on this entire manifestation from start to finish. So now I'm just going to tell you another one because this one just is still staggering. Uh-huh. I'm lying in the closet and I'm crying, which was my hobby in the early days. And I am thinking I have to call my friend Anne. Oh, don't bother her. Don't bother her. It's the middle of her work day. And I'm in the closet. And finally, after about a half hour of this, my phone rings. I drag myself up out of the closet. I go run and get the phone, and it's Anne. She says to me, Jamie, did you call me? I said, no, Anne, I was too busy crying on the closet floor, but I was thinking I had to call you. She says, Jamie, my phone rang, and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. So this blew our minds that he obviously was able to manipulate her phone so that I would show up on her caller ID so that she would call me because he knew I wanted to talk to her. So a couple of months after this, I tell this story at my writer's group. Gabe Uh Davis is the head of the group. He doesn't believe in anything. He's a devout atheist, as I had always been. I tell him the story with the phone trick, and he says, you know, I'd like to see that trick repeated. And this time, I would like to see whether your phone shows a record of having dialed out even when you don't use it. I forget that he said it. A month later, I'm meeting him and his wife for dinner, and I'm driving behind them. Suddenly, I feel that tidal wave of love again. Again, I notice the clock is 4.58. 
I get to the restaurant. I get out of my car. Gabe runs up to me. He says, Jamie, you won't believe what happened. What happened, Gabe? He says, at 4.58, my cell phone rang. He said, I looked at the caller ID, and your name and number appeared on the ID. He said, I picked the phone up, and a man's voice said, is Jamie there? Is Jamie there? (laughs) (laughs) He said the voice had an accent and extended the syllable there. Well, Jean was French, and when he would say there, it extended. Uh He said it wasn't a real call. The voice faded away, never hung up. He said, Jamie, get your phone. See if it dialed me. So I dig into the bottom of my purse because I hadn't used the phone all day. Sure enough, it answered his request. It had dialed out to him at 4.58. So what's the point? These over-the-top manifestations from Jean are outrageous because he's asked me to tell our story so that everybody listening knows we don't die. And we are not meant to not stay connected and not reconnect with our loved ones in spirit and after he left his body he said to me let our love shine like a torch that lights the path for others so our story is meant for everybody listening to let you know your loved ones are here with you too and they're just waiting for you to open your door to them yes yes what do you say when people um say that that jean i know in the book you mentioned that jean is a saint you know, that maybe he, he's yeah. a saint, yeah. and so he has these amazing abilities. Um, how do you respond Well, yeah, but you know that? what? The point being, love is the currency of connection. Yes. So, so the point being, yes, I'm very open. I was an open book. My atheism, I wasn't indoctrinated, which I talk about in part two. How can you overcome the false beliefs and religious teachings that prevent you from reconnecting? Because the yes. things we're told are possible. You know, we humans believe what we're told. If we're told a dental procedure is going to hurt, it hurts. If we're told it won't, it doesn't. If we're told yes. we can't reconnect, we don't. So I explain in part two of Love Never Dies what what you need to do in order to open up that channel. And so the first obstacle is to overcome the wrong belief that we're not supposed yeah. to stay in connection. And yeah. how do I know that this is a wrong belief? My first night back from Italy, I heard Jean quoting something that I didn't recognize. Now, the next day I went to his priest and I told him, Jean's been talking to me and he's quoting something. Now, the priest raises his brow in obvious skepticism, like, yo, this bitch has really rounded the bend, get the net, you know, (laughs) he has that look on his face. But then when I tell him what Jean was saying, the man blanched. He crossed himself and he said, dear God, Jamie, at first I didn't believe that Jean was talking to you, but I do now. And he told me, you are quoting an obscure biblical passage from the communion of saints. Like I would know. Uh I didn't read the Bible. I never went to church. And John and I didn't discuss religion. Now, it took me a year, Susan, to understand why Jean chose to quote that and only that passage to me. Uh Now, he was a religious pioneer in life. And he continues to be in the afterlife. The communion of saints says that our loved ones in spirit are one with or in communion with God and the saints. And since we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with God and the saints, this means the Bible is telling us we are supposed to stay in communion and communication with our loved ones in spirit because they are one with God and, and the saints. So the point is, Jean is telling us what we've been told about the afterlife is dead wrong if you'll pardon the pun. We are not meant to live in an emotional wasteland, separated from those we love, waiting until we die and we enter heaven. Because as Jean said, heaven is a state, not a place. Heaven is all around us. Heaven is here and now. So this means we are supposed to reconnect now. So in part two of Love Never Dies, after showing you this, very important revelation. I talk about all the other misconceptions surrounding the afterlife and afterlife communication in order to just help you rid yourself of any obstacles. Okay? Yes. You know, I have a question at the outset because there may be people listening who have had experiences like this and someone is right. telling them, you're hallucinating. And I know I you know, believe that me. very well. Yes. I know because that's what, you know, when we talk about part three, but, you know, the thing is, 
I, it is so obvious what is going on. And if, you know, people have said, oh, well, that's because you're grieving. Well, Gabe wasn't grieving and Anne wasn't yeah, grieving and Emily exactly. wasn't grieving. All exactly. these people that he brings into the story, they're not grieving. So this is exactly. not, you know, it's, you know, that's just plain BS, end of story. So, so I talk about all these misconceptions, like uh, here's okay. a common one that really blocks people. And this is very Western. You know, you're supposed to grieve, let go and move on in six months. And otherwise you have complicated grief. We're going to put a label on you. We're going to give you meds. This is not right. true. So people also say, oh, if you reconnect, you can't move on. Well, reconnecting, as I show you how to do in Love Never Dies, transforms your grief to joy. So not only do you not get stuck, you are more able to fully enter your life in joy because you're not lying there crying and grieving. You're present in a joyful way. Now, another thing that people will always say is, well, you know, you can't move on and, you know, form another relationship. Well, that would be like saying to a mother, you know, you love your first child. You can't have any more (laughs) because you can only love one. No, our hearts are made to love. We've got plenty of room to love everybody that walks the earth and everybody who's walking in spirit. Now, here's another one that people love to, um, you know, hold on to, and it is so untrue as well. They'll say, well, you're opening the door to evil. You know, oh yes, the devil, yes, the evil can, spirit. Yes, people I think know that, people will say but that. Mm-hmm. this is not true either. Because don't forget, our loved ones in spirit are here as our gatekeepers. They are pure love, and they are now our guards, our guardians, yeah. our guardian angels, our spirit guides. Plus the fact we all have something I call internal spiritual call blocking. You don't want to take the call, don't take the call. You know. Now, also in part two, I talk about how is it even possible? And what we're talking about here is nothing more than energetic communication, sending and receiving energetic signals. And I demystify this for you in part two of Love Never Dies by saying, listen, we energetically communicate all the time. We are born with the innate ability to communicate energetically, and we do it. Think about when you park at a light and you glance over at the driver in the neighboring car. Doesn't that driver always look back at you? Always. Because he senses the energetic frequency of your gaze and looks back. Twins Uh know when the other's in trouble, even if they're living on opposite ends of the world because they are energetically tied, right? Close couples Mm -hmm. know what the other is thinking. Again, energetically tied. So... And also I talk in part two of Love Never Dies about the prominent figures in history from Socrates to Helen Keller who report having had contact with spirits. And then I talk about the greatest scientists. You know, we always think that spirit and science are polar opposites, but Thomas Edison said in Scientific American in 1920 that it's reasonable to conclude that those who have left this earth would like to communicate with those they have left here. And he said, it is possible to construct an apparatus that is so delicate that we can allow them to get in touch with us and give them this opportunity. And he was working on this machine when he died in 31. Plus, Albert Einstein, in his introduction to Upton Sinclair's book on telepathy, mental radio, asked science to please take this phenomena seriously. And even Sigmund Freud in 1921 said, if I had my life to live over again, I would devote myself to psychic research rather than psychoanalysis. And Carl Jung also said the same thing. So basically, we don't reconnect because we've been told it's not possible. And here is a perfect example of this. I go back to my husband's priest, and I say to him, you know, Jean's continuing his manifestations. And the priest says to me, Jamie, once he's in heaven, you won't hear from him anymore. Oh, what, there are no cell towers in heaven? (laughs) Our cell signals aren't strong enough to reach heaven? I mean, it's ridiculous, these earthly conceptions, right? So this is bothering me all day, right? Bothering me. So now I make the circle for my group therapy in my home office. Everybody in the group is late except one woman named Ashley who's new, and she's never been in my house or my office before. She doesn't know me, doesn't know Jean just left his body. So here we are. The door is closed to my group room. When I hear ding, ding, this is the chime my front door makes when it opens and the burglar alarm signals that it's opened. Now we hear loud footsteps, and then the footsteps stop in the waiting room. So I say to her, gee, I guess someone got his or her time wrong and thinks it was an individual session time, not my group time. Now I hear the footsteps pounding to leave, and the door ding, dings again. I jump up. 
and I walk from my group room to the front door. Now, mind you, my driveway is extremely long, and where people park is so far from the house that there's no way anybody could have left the house, walked down the driveway, and gotten to his car without me seeing him. I open the front door. There's nobody there. I come back into my office, and I say to my patient, there was nobody there. And she says, it was a spirit. Well, that was Jean's answer to the priest. (laughs) Once I'm in heaven, you won't hear from me anymore. How's that? Did you hear that? Right. (laughs) Yeah. No. No, Kenny. I mean, it's just remarkable how many ways um, he reached out to you. I mean, what about... Um, there was something he did with the stars you mentioned early on. Oh, right, that I was so sad. And he said, just look up, Jamie, and I saw the shooting star. Yes. But the thing that's so cool, I'm going to tell you, because this last week was Valentine's Day, I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind, Uh and this is eight years later. All right, but let let me... Let me give you, yeah, always, every damn day. It's a ride Wonderful. and a half, girl. <laughs> so now part three of Love Never Dies. I show you how to establish your own connection with loved ones and yes. spirits without the assistance of a channeler, medium, or psychic. Now, remember I said we're all born with this innate ability to communicate mm-hmm. with spirit. And communicating is nothing more than learning how to tune your brain to what I call the spirit channel, okay? So Jean showed me how to do this. And in Love Never Dive, Dies, I share with you what Jean showed me. So the first chapter in part three is how you can create a state of receptivity. And Jean said to me, Jamie, the noise of the day drowns me out. So anytime you want to hear me, come to the bed and be still and quiet. So this is the first thing I show you how to do is to sit in silence, turn off the TV, turn off the music, turn it down. Because to hear spirit, you've got to be more still and quiet. So I show you peaceful practices and show you how to pick the one that's right for you, yoga, tai chi, qigong. And then I also show you how to breathe because breathing, spirit is born on the breath. Then I talk about how to surrender to all your emotional states without getting too upset. Because if you get too upset, now you turn the spirit channel off. And it not only blocks our sending, but it also blocks our receiving of their signals. I show you you how to use... Can we stop there for just a second? Yeah. Because that's such an important area. Is that, you know, even in your own grief, you know, just... Um, you you yep. speak of emotional flooding at one point yes. in this book, and versus you know letting your emotions through. Yes. And I felt you know as a therapist, what it's a very important distinction that that you very. laid out, and I wonder if you could speak to that for those who are I in will. grief. Who are listening right, to this. because so often we think, and this is a mistake that a lot of therapists make too, oh, it's good, get in touch with your feelings, scream you. Not true, because it's very easy for us to get washed overboard. It's not yes. good for us, it's not good for our bodies. So we have to titrate our emotions to be aware of them, but sort of be like an eagle in the corner, stepping back, looking down upon ourselves with a little bit de- of detachment, like a living meditation. And we need to do this so that we don't get washed overboard because we need to reconnect. You know, I do a radio show called Love Never Dies on Hay House Radio every Tuesday, 9 a.m. Pacific time. People call from all over the world, and so many will say to me, this passage in the book helped me a lot because you know I was so upset or they'll say I'm so upset I don't feel anything so I'm saying you've got to tune it down a little bit because then you're more able to send and receive and then when you are able to send and receive it lifts you up so it's the greatest thing in the world now because as you get more of these signs and messages and as you begin to dialogue you feel less grief stricken So another way that I show you also how to receive is to use the hypnagogic or twilight states just before falling asleep and just before you fully wake up in the morning. And then I have these fun five sense exercises because spirit is pure energy, so they're able to energetically send signals to all of our senses. So the more your receiver is turned on, the easier it's going to be for you to perceive the signs that they're sending your way. So I give you senses uh, exercises to open up your five senses. Now, the next chapter in part three of Love Never Dies is recognizing the signs. Because most people yes. will say to me, you know, I'm not getting any signs. This isn't happening to me. And then I lay out the signs of spirit presence and everybody invariably says, oh, well, that happened and so did that. I didn't realize. I overlooked it. So for most, just recognizing the signs is enough to start your reconnection. Because again, freed from the human vessel, they are able to influence the material world in infinite ways. Sounds, animals behaving oddly like the chipmunk 
bo- odd bodily sensations, drafts, temperature changes, chills, goose flesh, butterflies. And another thing is symbolic communications like manifesting coins that were minted on the year that was significant to you and to them. And this year, on the anniversary of Jean's bodily death, I'm telling a patient of mine named Kyla, you know, Jean will flood me with coins that were minted uh-huh. on the year that he left his body. So she uh-huh. blinks and she says to me, Jamie, I almost forgot. See my cowboy boots that I'm wearing? She says, I'm taking them off because they were off in my bedroom last week when I saw a quarter careening from the ceiling down into the boot. And I got a message. It was for you, and I never took it out, and I forgot. So she says, oh, let me dump goodness. this. Can you believe it? She says, let me dump this upside down and give you the coin. Now I hear Jean saying to me, well, Jamie, you'll see it was minted on the year I left my body. I get my glasses. Sure enough, it was. So now this is the most cool part of Love Never Dies. And the CEO of Hay House said, Jamie, we've never seen anything like this. Because in Love Never uh-huh. Dies, I'm taking spirit communication to a new place. Yeah. I show you how you can dialogue with the departed to reconnect, to obtain guidance, and even to heal unfinished business. Now, I want you to know that Spirits dialogue, obviously, in various ways. So in addition to dialoguing with us through dreams and mind melding, and they can also communicate with us through signs. Now, signs are a static form of communication where they're like dropping a sign us on us and we observe it. But we can also engage in back and forth communications between us and spirit. So let me give you an example of the difference between a static sign versus a back-and-forth communication. Can I? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. So on the anniversary week of Jean's bodily death this year, I went to my chiropractor, and Teresa was at the reception desk, and we, we were alone in the office. So I'm telling her about Love Never Dies, and I said, this is the first week I'm going to give a public talk on the topic. I smelled gardenias. That's a sign, okay? I didn't uh-huh. say a word. She says to me, do you smell gardenias? So he sent the same sign to her. I said, Teresa, that's the scent of sanctity. Jean is giving us both a sign that he's here. Now, the next day, I saw a patient who needed to reconnect with her sister in spirit. I told her the story about the scent of gardenias. And at that moment, I heard Jean saying to me, I wish I could give you a bouquet of roses. Jean gave me roses every week peach-colored roses. I'm going to tell you about that in a second. So Jean was dialoguing with me by putting that thought in my mind. I wish I could give you a bouquet of roses. My patient abruptly sat up and she said to me, Jamie, do you smell roses? Now, in that beautifully elegant manifestation, he put that thought in her mind, using her to facilitate a back-and-forth dialogue between him and me. So he used her to let me know I had heard him correctly, bolstering her confidence and her ability to hear spirit so that she could reconnect with her sister. So he was dialoguing, using her as the open vessel. Okay? Now, yeah. let me give you another example of how we dialogue with spirit using people who are open vessels. Open vessels being someone who is willing to be used in the service of love, the very young, the very old, the disabled, the sick. Anybody who's been broken open is more willing and able to be used. I'm going to have dinner with my friend Anne, and I say out loud to Jean before she arrives, you know, Jean, it feels like you're coming home to me whenever she comes because she allows you to speak through her. Two seconds later, Anne arrives, She opens the door and she says, honey, I'm home. (laughs) Now, that she claps her hand over her mouth because she thought it was a rude joke. And I said, no, it wasn't a rude joke. That was Jean's answer back to me. He heard me say, it's like you're coming home to me. And he Uh had you dialogue with me to say, honey, I'm home. Now we're out to the dinner, out to dinner. And Anne is stoical. She wouldn't cry if her kid was hit by a bus. Next thing I know, she gets a glazed expression over her face like that chipmunk. And now I see tears are coming out of her eyes. And she says, you look so beautiful tonight, I wish I had a camera. Now, Jean used to say this to me. Nobody ever heard it. It was only when we were alone. So he was dialoguing with me, using her as an open vessel to send his messages and let me know I heard you too. Now, here is a Valentine's Day example 
that I promised to tell you about how yes, he used a person. And this is an example of both using somebody as an open vessel and also using an earthly prop, which is an electronic device usually. So this guy, J.C. Gold, heard me on Coast to Coast, and he wrote to me, and he said that Jean had been coming through to him powerfully. He's a um, a medium, and he's a channeler, and he uh-huh. is able to illustrate people's relatives and then get messages. But he's never felt anything like Jean, and Jean was blasting into him. So he tells me that he was about to write me an email when his hands were in his lap. He wasn't even touching his computer when he heard Jean say to him, Send Jamie the peach rose photo. The next thing JC sees, his computer shows a menu of all of his wife's professional photos. She was a, she's a photographer. And Jean opens a photo of the peach rose. Now, remember I told you he gave me peach roses every week. Okay? Yes. So the peach rose opens. Still JC's hands are not on his computer. And now the... Name of the photo pops up, and it's called Peaches and Cream. The night before, J.C. had written to me, and he said, Jean says your time is now. And I had written back saying, Jean told me the cream always rises to the top. And the name <laughs> of the photo was Peaches and Cream. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Wonderful. You know, I, so, I think there is magic around you, Jamie. There's just no question yeah. because, you know, something happened. I have to tell you something that happened yeah. in L.A., no, you'll find this interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've been seeing quarters, okay? Um, I've been yeah. seeing a lot of quarters. I don't store money in my checked luggage, and I had your right. book with me. I brought it yeah. to L.A. To, to have at my booth, and a quarter, which I actually took a picture of, and now I need to look at yeah. that picture because I, I might be able to see the date on it, was in yeah. my checked luggage just mysteriously. I mean, just laying there. And, and I know, it I wasn't there before. quarters. Right. No, I don't yep. know how it – there is no way it could have gotten I know. there, to my knowledge, because I don't put money I know. And the in thing my is, luggage. And the thing is, told me, <laughs> Susan, it's so true. Anybody who comes into contact with me, he said, Jamie, right after he left his body, now do you understand why you're Dr. Love? Because all the millions of people you love and touch – I can love and touch them through you. And I'm getting calls now on the Hay House radio show where people are actually talking to Jean and praying to Jean uh-huh. and then feeling that tidal wave of love and then miracles are happening. So it's just so wonderful. So now I want to talk about how you can dialogue. Yeah. Um, how you can dialogue. Well, let me give you this other example. Do we have time for another example? Oh, we have. We, we're doing really well on time. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. good. So. So I want to, again, show you how loved ones in spirit dialogue with us using earthly props, especially electronic devices, because they are pure energy, so their energy can easily interrupt electronic devices and make them do things, like I just described my Valentine's gift, you know, with the, with the, the peach rose. So yes. right after Jean left his body, I was crying, and I said to him, Jean, why is it everybody's saying I am glowing when all I do is ball? <laughs> you know, crying, crying. <laughs> and he says to me, Jamie, brides glow, and we are newlyweds in the new spiritual phase of our relationship. Okay? Now an email pops up, and it's from a disabled man I do not know who had written to me a month before asking me if my review of a mattress was legit. Did I like this online? Really, was my online review of the mattress legit? And at the time when he had written to me, I said, it's legit, but I can't talk to you. My husband just died. So this night, that man writes to me again. And he says to me, I thought you would like to see a photo of my beloved bird named Jamie. Now, That was already wild enough because Jean and I had a bird that we loved named Fluffy. So I open up the picture, and yes, it's a picture of a bird with the caption, Jamie. But underneath that is another attached photo. I open it up. Susan, I I still am flabbergasted. It's a picture of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Now, where did Jean go with me on our honeymoon? Paris. Uh (laughs) And where did our hotel room overlook? The Arc de Triomphe. So he's saying to me, I just told you we're newlyweds, and I'm showing you where we went on our honeymoon. So I immediately write back to this guy, and I say, do you know why you sent me this additional photo of Paris and the Arc de Triomphe? I never heard back from the guy. And I am convinced that this man wasn't a living being. I believe that Jean communicated with me through this 
earthly prop, this got, this email address. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't understand it. So, but when you don't understand it, it's of the divine. So, my point being, just suspend everything you think you know, and just be open to begin the process of dialoguing. And it, it, at the very minimum. Sometimes we need to dialogue to say goodbye. If someone was ripped from you due to a sudden illness or accidental death, you need to be able to say goodbye to the person's physical body. But also we need to reconnect to get support as we travel down the bumpy road called life. And they're here also as our guides to help us complete our spiritual development and give us guidance. Now here's the thing I kept referring to before. What if you need to work out unfinished business? Well, now in part three of Love Never Dies, I show you how you can dialogue to heal any unfinished business you have. So first I show you how to enter a trance, and then I share with you my meditation for making contact, and then I show you how to dialogue back and forth. And you can do this in writing, but I encourage you to speak out loud, not only saying your words, but also saying the other being's words. You could also use a tape recorder, but you also want to repeat not only what you're saying, but what you hear. And here's the most wonderful part about the dialoguing with the departed technique. And this is so absolutely reassuring to everybody who harbors unfinished business. Often we have to wait until a being leaves his body in order to work it out with that being because in spirit form they are more evolved. In spirit form they see how they screwed up. And I found this out. The first week after Jean left his body, I took the car into the garage. Jean did the car thing. They didn't know me. I go inside, and I say to Debbie, hello, Jean died of a bee sting. And she says, I'm a widow, too. At that moment, her husband starts banging down my door to give me a message for her. And he says, tell her to stop making the same mistake I did because now she's creating the same power struggle that I did. Now, how would I know this? I don't know the woman, wow. but he's telling me this. But the most important part of it was I realized he got where he made a mistake and he didn't get it till he left his body. Okay? So now there's one more thing that we need to know. They need us to confront them with the mistakes that they made in order for them to evolve spiritually. Now, how do I know this? On Good Friday, the first Good Friday, Jean told me I had to go see the bird lady. Now, we had that Fluffy, uh, our little canary named Fluffy, Uh and I was unable to save him. We tried to have this bird lady save him, but we couldn't. So here we are on Good Friday, and I am just led to go to her place. I walk in the door, and she says to me, do you see this Gouldian finch? Now, I don't know the woman. I, I only saw her when I asked her to help me save my bird. I don't know anything about her. And she says, this Gouldian finch hasn't eaten for two days, and if it doesn't eat by the, the, today, it will be dead by tonight. It's so small. So I say to her, may I try to help this little bird? And she says, go ahead. I come over to the cage. I put my cheek against the bar. Normally a bird would be frightened by this, but this bird is not. And now I begin to speak to the bird. And again, this is energetic communication, right? Because birds don't speak English per se, and I am speaking out loud so she'll hear what I'm saying. I say to the bird, go down to that seed bowl and start eating right now. The bird instantly listens to me, jumps down, and starts scarfing up seeds like a little mini vacuum. And as the bird is eating, the bird's getting more energy and jumping around and starting to peep. Well, now I sense that there is a presence in this room And it feels like it's Lainey's mother. And the mother is saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't protect you from him. I'm sorry I was such a weakling. I say this to Lainey, and she says to me, oh, my gosh, my mother always used that word, I'm a weakling, I'm a weakling, that expression. Mm -hmm. So now I look at the bird, and the bird is looking very messed up again. He's craning his neck up like something, he's seeing or hearing something, and now I'm realizing there's a spirit presence that's been making the bird sick. So I say to the bird, listen, go back to eating. I'm here. I'll help Lainey with the spirit. The bird goes back. So now I say to Lainey, listen, my eyes are being pulled to the ceiling, and I see this purple witching ball on the ceiling. And I know I owned one at one time. Did I give it to her as a present? Why am I looking at it? Clairsentience, that the spirit is making me look up there so that I will talk about it That's the segue in. And I ask her, did I give it to you? No, she says, I bought it for protection. 
Now the spirit of her father says, you don't need protection from me anymore. I can't hurt you. And I am begging you to stop being the fearful little girl and face me, confront me. I need you to confront me about how I molested you sexually. So in this amazing example, I realized he needed her to confront him as much as she needed to confront him in order for her to do her own healing. So it's a synergy. You know, it's a win-win. We heal and so do they. So that is what I show you how to do. And I've got lots of case examples in the third part of Love Never Dies of dialoguing with the departed to heal any unfinished business you have. Yes. Yes, I, but here's I think the most, it's beautiful this is, how it is. It's really a partnership, you know, that we think of them is. as in some, you know, blissful finished state somehow, Mm-mm. and yet we're really they helping need them. And we that's are, an and if we help love. ourselves. Yes, exactly. and, it's, it's, and now, love. it's love. And so now that you said it's love, here's the neatest part of all. Because we yes. all know what is our purpose on earth, right? It's to perfect our ability to love ourselves and others. This life is our love lab. Our relationships are our love lab. Now, but we can't love others if we don't love ourselves. Now, I am living proof of this challenge. How do you love yourself fully when you were raised in a nutty family? You know, all shrinks came from (laughs) nutty families. I'm no exception, right? I was beaten physically and verbally. And the problem is I continued to hear my parents' mean voices, putting me down in my head, ripping me down, tearing down my Mm self-esteem. And Jean, in spite of all the love that he had for me, he couldn't somehow get through to me and make their voices go away. Now, Mm -hmm. after he left his body... I'm in my professional group in New York City, and I am tormented. And I'm saying, I have to get these voices to go away. I can't. I, you know, I, I've tried my whole life, and it doesn't work. So they all said, well, we have to yell louder than they are yelling at you. Well, it wasn't working. So I go home, and Jean comes to me in the most beautiful manifestation. He appears to me as the embodiment of love. He's surrounded in golden light. He takes my face in his hand. He turns me toward him. And he says, listen, 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 listen to me and allow my love to enter you. And here's the most amazing thing. His earthly love for me could not enter me. But now that he was in spirit form, freed from the vessel of his human body, his spirit and his love was able to easily enter me. And in that instant, his love for me became my love for myself. So what I'm saying here is that your amazing fast track to self-love is to reconnect with your loved ones in spirit because all that love that they harbor for you is just waiting for you. All you have to do is just open the door of your heart and allow them to heal your unfinished business, heal every corner of your soul. Now you are filled to overflowing with love that you can share with the world and you are just an overflowing well of love for yourself and humanity. That's love never dies. Yes. Yes, it it radiates to us and from us, and yeah. I, I just I just love you know. There's a quote I wrote down um, from your book. Something he communicated to you. My full time occupation is to love you. Yeah, he said. And where he, where would I go, Jamie? What else is there for me to do? It's my full time occupation to love you. I think that is <laughs> so often, incredibly beautiful. If we could know, know. that. If we could really I hear that, that all the time from my patients, yeah. loved ones. Over and over, that's what they say. What, and, you know, I talk about that in Love Never Dies, the fallacy, another misconception. Oh, well, you know, if you call upon them, you're interfering with their heavenly work. Oh, yes. That's BS, yes. too. I that is that. BS, mm-hmm. because what else do they have to do but to love us? That's it. And they do, and and of course they're going to express it. You know, I I wonder if on that side, um, how it feels when they're reaching out and people aren't paying attention. I I, I sometimes wonder. You know, it's like I'm showing oh, you yeah. this. I'm showing you that. Pay attention. That's pay why. Attention. That's why they beat down the door of somebody who's open. You know, like like at the at the the car repair shop. He was pounding. Oh, finally, I can get through to her. You know. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And 
And so I, I just feel that as we enter the, the last five minutes or so of the show, I, I just I feel that you have such a powerful and really a courageous message to share. And that's something you say at the outset that, you know, writing all of this at first was a courageous act for you. And I think um, you inspire Every time I tell the story, all. it's courageous. It's always yes. courageous because, you know, the more you go out there and you buck traditional ideas and beliefs, the more you're a target. You know, I mean, that's just the way yeah. it is. But I have no choice. I have to tell this story because I want everybody to know what you've been told about the afterlife is dead wrong and you are not supposed to live in this emotional wasteland separated from those you love, waiting till you die and enter heaven, <laughs> you know, waiting to be reconnected. It's not true. Yes, yes. I I, I love how, um, you know, there are so many misconceptions and how you, you really clear that up and in a very love-based way, it all comes back to love. Um, yeah. So in these final moments, Jamie, and by the way, he's been with us today because I've been watching as we've been talking. The show's been trending on the front page, hopping up, 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 up to number four. It got as high as number four <laughs> of all the shows on Block Talk Radio in every nice. possible category. <laughs> well, and, you know, it's awesome so because um, <laughs> everybody is really, really. I did the Coast to Coast show, and Love Never Dies became an overnight bestseller from that yeah. one interview and sold out on Amazon because I, we're really touching a chord here. People know yeah. in their hearts what is true. Our hearts know. Yes, yes, ab- absolutely. And, yeah, and number one in spirituality, too. So, I mean, I, I appreciate nice. his presence here right now. I mean, it's right nice. here with us and, and reaching out. And I know that it's reaching out across time to people who will listen to this show in the future and that we're with them, too, energetically. I always try to tell people that because across time he's with us as well. So tell us, Mm -hmm. um, as we we end, just remind everyone where they can find out more about you, more about your show, which sounds just wonderful, Um, Mm -hmm. and um, just just leave the audience with where they can find you, Dr. James. Okay, so first of all, the easiest way to find me is at my main website, drlove.com. Or ask drlove.com. It's D R A S K D R or D R Love.com. And when you sign up for my free newsletter, you will receive a free excerpt of Love Never Dies just to get you going. Then after you read the book, uh, come on back and we'll enter you in my love sweepstakes. The details are all at Ask Dr. Love and drlove.com. Same site, it just redirects. And then also, if you want to speak to me live, you can call in to my Hay House show, hayhouseradio.com. That's Tuesdays, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And, of course, the Ask Dr. Love radio show, you can find out about that as well. I just moved to Transformation Talk Radio, so now I'm on AM, uh-huh. FM, cable, satellite, Internet, so I'm basically all over with that show as well. But everything you can find at Ask Dr. Love and drlove.com. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I it's been just wonderful to hear you tell your story which carries so much power and then just what it reveals as to what we all can do. The steps. Absolutely. And the sky is the limit and there is no limit in the sky. <laughs> that that is absolutely true. You know, that yeah. there's no limit to heaven. <laughs> no. And, you know, as Jean said, death is an illusion, Jamie. There is a very thin veil between the realm where you are and the realm where I am. The veil is thinner than you can ever imagine. I'm standing right here. So what does that mean? Don't wait. Reconnect now. Make peace if need be. And transform your grief to joy. Allow them to guide you and support you and heal every corner of your soul. Yes. Well, Thank you again for sharing this Thank here you. today. And what Thank you for having to... me. It was wonderful. Oh, well, you have a wonderful day, and and I just, um, I'm just i excited to hear how this continues to evolve because I know that yeah. your ministry, as you put it in your book, is continuing. Oh, yeah, and you know what? I'm, it, Love Never Dies is going to be made into a movie and also a TV show, so I, I forgot to mention anybody oh, who wants wonderful. to dialogue, if you want to do the dialoguing with the departed technique, 
on the camera for the the pilot for the TV show, reach out to me at Ask Dr. Love. Use the contact button, and um, perhaps I'll be able to put you and uh, uh, in that sizzle reel for the TV show and and have you share the dialoguing with the departed technique with me live on the camera. Okay. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And you take care. Thank you. I appreciate you being too. Here and today. and keep 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 ca- catching up with those quarters and pennies cuz Jean is oh, sending them you your bet. way. <laughs> you bet. Okay, take care. All right. Take care. Um just a quick note to the live audience real quick. Our next show Monday, February 23rd, 7 p.m., Dr. Art Markman, we're going to talk about smart change. Um frontierbeyondfear.com is where you need to go to learn about all the upcoming episodes. And also this episode will be highlighted there for quite some time, and you can access the entire over four-year history of shows. And I am just so delighted to be bringing on these wonderfully inspirational guests that are making such a difference in the world and in your personal lives. That's the whole purpose here, is we are here to change lives. So... Um, and to give you the tools and the opportunity to find transformation and most of all, love, because love is at the basis of everything. So take care, everyone, and I do hope to see you back here again, as I say, Monday, February 23rd, 7 p.m. Pacific, Dr. Art Markman, and that will be an interesting show because we're going to talk about how we change habits that we're clinging to. So I am very much looking forward to that show as well. And as I let you go from the podcast, um, just another reminder that our guest today, her book, Love Never Dies, Dr. Jamie Turndoff, AskDrLove.com, and many of you can see that on the page I do invite you to visit that. And also, you can talk with her on her show on Hay House, which is really cool. So if you have questions, um, what a wonderful place for you to communicate with Dr. Jamie. So, again, take care, everyone. Be in peace. Find those moments of stillness so that you, too, can hear. (laughs) 